putting out on my account may well be work-related, but there's also other stuff going on there. And people are looking for that personal connection, and I don't think that you will get that off of a blog service. So uh, to answer your question, I would say if, you're, if you can't do it yourself, don't do it. I would not recommend a blog service. Um, this is where I find out that five of you are doing blog services, and I'm in big trouble. All right, the corporate role in a wiki. Um, similar, but not identical. Organization. Um, it needs to, somebody needs to sort of organize it, figure out where everything needs to go, get it up and running, feed in some content so that when the wiki goes live, it's not completely you know, naked with no content at all and encourage people to participate. That can be done through some pretty basic stuff like, hey, if you write something, we'll give you a t-shirt. Um, I would not encourage you to really pay people a lot, but I would encourage um, what we in impolitely refer to as trash and trinkets, just little things that you can give people to encourage them to participate. Um, if you are seriously looking at wikis, and I have this link at the end of the presentation, you really need um, the book called Wiki Patterns, which was put out by somebody called Stuart Mader, and there's also a site called wikipatterns.com, I believe. You'll want to take a look at that. He's got some information about how you build wikis and the various ways of doing it, the various strategies for getting wikis up and running. Again, moderation, minimal moderation. If somebody posts something that is incorrect, you may want to fix it. If somebody posts something and says, well, I think this is really hard to use, they're allowed to say that. You know, they're, they're entitled to their opinion. So something to consider there. Now, um, oops, sorry, I need my cursor back. Strategy number three. In addition to dealing with search and providing infrastructure, you need to listen. You need to pay attention to what people are saying. And I think I've, I've touched on this. Um, so you need to listen to what people are saying. And um, again, you don't have to do what they say. You just need to take it into account and really see what's coming along there. There are some ways of doing this. Um, and <laughs> this space moves really, really fast. I wrote this slide yesterday. It's already obsolete. Okay? So Google has something called alerts. You can set up keywords. And every time a particular keyword comes up, it will send you an alert. Twitter has search. Um, so search.twitter.com allows you to search Twitter. And I'll come back to why, why this is obsolete in a second. For blogs, you can use subscriptions, RSS feeds, and search. Um, again, uh, blogsearch.google.com. Uh, Technorati used to work, but I think it's broken. So there are ways of searching the blogs. And then there are other social media, uh, things like Facebook and Foursquare. If you're in something like the restaurant industry and other, other kinds of service businesses, you probably need to be on Yelp, which is mostly about um, things like restaurant reviews, uh, hair salon reviews, those kinds of things. Now, the reason the slide is obsolete is because Google announced this morning that they are now supporting real-time search. You can go to Google, put in a search, and say, show me the latest results and it will do an automatic refresh on the results. Uh, I was looking at this about an hour ago. It's absolutely incredible. So something to consider there. Um, I have a question here. Can I cite some examples of personal connection content? Um, it's interesting because although you most of the time need to stay with professional information and with information that's relative to your work, there is also that thing where people want to hear other things. So um, maybe two months, no, less than that, maybe a month ago on Twitter, um, I saw a posting from somebody referring to uh, buttermilk cookies and a recipe that she had. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. And we had this whole discussion about buttermilk cookies, which led to I need the recipe, which I then subsequently used for um, a big, huge cookie party that I had this weekend. Well, that connection that we've made um, and I think Hylas, and I think she's on the call somewhere, that connection that we made had very little to do with work, but it's memorable. And you know, a year from now, I'm going to remember to send along some of the other cookie recipes that I think that she might appreciate. And so there's just that kind of information going on. Those of you that follow me on Twitter probably know that I like chocolate. Uh, you probably know that I like to cook. And um, you know, some other things kind of along those lines. 
that is a very, very different kind of connection than the sort of very, um, I want to say vanilla, but in the context that's wrong, the sort of very bland, corporate, deadly, and boring sorts of information that you get from what I would describe as an official corporate kind of communication. It makes a huge, huge difference to have that. Um, and somebody else mentions watch LinkedIn for discussions about your company. So another place to go and search and make sure that you're watching these things. Um, but I do think it makes a big difference to have those connections and people that know each other and that, that like each other. Um, because if you make that kind of connection with an end user, okay, and then they run across a problem that makes them very unhappy in your product, they are more likely to send you a polite message or perhaps a polite tweet rather than writing one that's full of really bad words and saying things like, I'll never do, you know, I'll never use your product again. Because you don't want to go there when, it's, when you know there's a real person behind there. So that's kind of why I would recommend um, that more personal kind of touch or connection. Uh, somebody else pointed out that you can pay attention to Twitter uh, follow it, and then use the information, the negative tweets coming in, send them to the people that are responsible for fixing that. Um, and that actually ties in quite nicely with my next slide. Uh, it may not be particularly enjoyable to have people complaining in the way that they inevitably will, but it's actually much, much more productive to have people contributing, even if they're angry and even if they're cranky, it is much more productive to have them contributing than it is for them to just not be doing anything. So you want to use that emotion. When somebody complains and says, um, I couldn't figure out how to do this. It was really difficult, and I got stuck, and I'm frustrated. You, as an insider within an organization, can use that, especially if it's one of your pet peeves about the product. You can use that to push for product improvement. You can say, look, look at what this user is complaining about. Now, we like to, as a technical writer, communicator types, talk about being a user advocate. But in reality, it's difficult because if you're getting paid by the corporation, if you're getting paid by an organization, they may or may not want you to be a user advocate. But if you can point to outside resources, outside people who are coming back and saying, I don't like this, then you may be able then to push back and get people to improve the product because it's not me complaining. Look, it's the users, people who paid for our product are complaining. So let's do something about it. The real point that I would like you to take away from this session, if you don't know this already, is that the balance of power is shifting probably permanently. In the olden days, it was possible, again, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was possible essentially to buy influence, to buy attention, because as a corporation owning the means of distribution of information and having access to the means of distribution of information meant that really the corporate voices, the official voices, plus the large book publishers were the ones that were heard. Uh, now that influence, that voice, may or may not be heard, depending on how the corporation handles things. And a third-party blogger might become the person that is the most influential about a certain kind of content. Now, this has happened before. If you go back a few years, uh, O'Reilly & Associates, the publisher, put out a pretty well-known series of books, including one called Word Annoyances. Word Annoyances is a very, very popular third-party book that talks about how to bend Word, Microsoft Word, to your will. And they sold a lot of books. Um, they were perhaps more popular than the official Microsoft Word documentation. And this was sort of pre-user-generated content. I mean, they did get a mass market publisher to pick them up, and they got bookstore distribution and all the rest of it. But these days, you could have a blog called Word Annoyances or something along those lines, and it could be very, very influential. And I'm, I, I believe that actually they have moved online. So as the balance of power is shifting, if I'm one of the people on the inside, if I'm one of these corporate voices, then what do I have to do in order to earn that influence back for my organization? 